Day everyone, I'm Jason Peacock and I'm here to bring you a review of Marvel Crisis Protocol, a new Marvel themed miniatures tabletop game. This is similar to Games Workshop games like Necromunda. The best way to explain the rules is to go through a game turn with you. So let me give you an overview of how this game plays and then we'll come back with so my thoughts. So here's the content you get in the main box. You get 10 superheroes, Baron Zemo, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Black Widow, Captain Marvel, Captain America, Red Skull, Crossbones, Ultrons, Doc Ock. You get a little kiosk, a couple of dumpsters, a couple of cars, some street lamps, and a little garbage can. Each side is going to have a team of around five heroes. The game rules that come with the book just show the setup for the tutorial scenario. Now each stat card is going to have the amount of hit points they take till they're wounded. When they lose that many, they will be slipped over to their wounded side. Sometimes they might get a more powerful ability. If they take that same amount of damage again, then they are knocked out from the battle. So you've got your hit points, your movement speed, this indicates you use the medium movement tool. Your size. Uh, this is how many points uh, your team cost. This is how many dice you roll when you're taking physical damage. How many dice you roll when you're taking energy damage. And how many dice you roll when you're taking mental damage, psychic damage. You have a list of attacks that each guy can do. The type of attack. How far away. How many dice you roll. How much power it costs you. Then you have your superheroes. This here would be a active superpower. These are always in effect. And sometimes you're going to have a reactive superpower. Right there, which lets you react on another player's turn or whenever the trigger is. When you play a game, you're going to combine crisis cards. You've got your red and your blue. You're going to play with one red one and one blue one. They are gonna tell you which maps to set up with and put your objectives. So if it says map B, this tells you where the tokens are and how far from the edge you put them. You combine the two and do the setup and then you're ready to begin. So at the very beginning of a turn, you have the power phase. This is where every hero gets a power token put on their card. This is the main one of two ways you get it. It's usually every time you take a damage, you get one power per damage that you take, and you get one at the start of every power phase. And then players are gonna alternate taking turns. This is also the point where if you were knocked down below your health, you were considered to be stunned during that round. At this stage of the game is where you would flip them over onto their side and they get one last go at things. Turns are going to alternate back and forth. Each character can do two actions and then they can use any number of their superpowers. Uh, moving is an action, attacking is an action, any superpower they have that is considered that has the word action that would be one as well. So say I'm going to activate Red Skull here. He's got a movement of M, so I would grab the medium move tool. Now they come gray, I'm just in the process of painting them. So I can put that against his base, bend it however I want, I would move him like that. I could move him again, I could attack. His attack, he's got a range 4 attack right here, and it's one power to use. So I'm looking... Everyone's just out of range, so he's just going to move again. His turn's done. I put an activation token on him to show that he's gone. Then the other team's going to go. So say they move uh, Spider-Man here. Now, if the dumpster is considered size 1 and Spider-Man's considered size 2, that means people can freely move on it. If, however, they don't have climbing or flying and they want to move on to a building that's a bigger size of them, they have to be within range two of that building. Then they can just do a 
climb action, which basically lets you move short distance up on top of that building. Spider-Man has climbed, so he can freely move on top of the building. The sizes matter because if you're being targeted from a, from a distance of two away from the building, and you are smaller than the building, then they can't see you. If part of the building is blocking line of sight, then you're going to get cover. And that's going to let you... Cover lets you turn one of your dice results into a block. So let's say Spider-Man moves there, and now we're going to activate Captain America. His first action is going to be to strike Spider-Man. So the range is two... He's just out of range, so he can't use that. So he's going to throw his shield, which is range 4. Spider-Man's considered to be the size of the object he's on. So we've got a size 3 building plus a size 2 Spider-Man, which is size 5. So you're not going to get any benefits being on top of a building. So he is doing a shield throw. It doesn't cost him any power, and he's going to roll 4 dice. I rolled all blanks, which was a terrible roll. But let's explain the dice faces. This here means it's a miss and it cannot be re-rolled. You're locked in with that dice. This is a successful block when you are defending. This is a critical. It counts as a success for both attacking and blocking and lets you re-roll, lets you add another dice and roll that. However, if you roll another critical, you don't get to roll another dice. It only works once. This is a successful hit when you're attacking. And this is a wild. It counts as a success, both blocking and attacking. And many powers will give you an added effect if you roll one of these. So let's try and pretend I rolled better than that. All right, so there we go. I got three hits and a critical, which will let me add another dice. Nothing happens. Now, Spider-Man is going to defend, and he has three dice against physical attacks. So Spider-Man will roll his dice. He's got one critical, which is a success, and he'll roll another dice and a wild. So he got two successes. The difference is one... Spider-Man will take a wound, and he will gain one power for that wound. There's also a lot of powers that will allow you to throw a building of a certain size or lower. Now, two characters that are released outside of the base game. We've got Hulk here and MODOK. Now, there's characters in the base game that throw, like Captain Marvel can throw. Um, Hulk can, si can throw a size 3 or lower. So if Hulk was here and he uses his throw skill, uh, it costs 3 or 4 power. It says you can throw any object up to size 3 or lower, or maybe even 4 and lower, up to medium range away. So Hulk would pick up that building, he would remove it from play, and... Whoever's on top would just immediately drop down to where they were on the battlefield. And then that player has to dodge, which make, is essentially rolling your physical defense dice against the size of the object being thrown at you, plus one. So if this was a size three building, Captain America would have to defend a four physical attack. Uh, you can generally throw other characters as well. So if you throw one character at another, um, the person being thrown at has to make that dodge roll and the person being thrown automatically takes a wound you've got objective tokens on the board running up to those generally score you some kind of points once everyone's done activating you keep track of the score on this first one is 16 wins and if not by the time you get to the end of round six whoever has the most wins if two people are tied for 16 at the end of, uh, um, say, the fourth round, play will continue until someone ends a round with more points. If they're tied at the end of the sixth round, then whoever has more healthy characters on the field 
would win. And healthy characters just means not flipped over to the red side. Typically, when you interact with a token on the battlefield, the crisis card will tell you what they do. Uh, players score one victory point, securing the close. Two victory points for the center and three victory points for the shelter during the cleanup phase. When you are securing something, you simply have a character that's within range one. If you have one wounded character within range one and the opponent has a healthy, they will secure it. If there's two enemies there, they're just contesting it. Uh, and if there's a tie, like say each side has one character that's healthy that's next to it, then nothing's going to happen. If one character has two healthy and the other one has one, the person with more characters is going to uh, win that one. Here's a better example. Players score one victory point for each extremist council console they secure during the cleanup phase. So once everyone's activated, you have the cleanup phase. That's when you're going to score points. You don't score points for knocking people out, just objectives on the board. And it's always going to be a combination of two crisis cards. Most of them involve tokens on the board that you want to secure or an object on the board that you're going to pick up and hold on to. The only way you drop an object is if you get stunned. Then you drop it within two and your opponent can place it. I kind of wish that you would drop an object when you get thrown, but you don't. The last thing I need to talk about are these Team Tactics cards. Now, all the as expansion characters get released, they're going to add new ones to these. Each team is going to have four brought to the game. And these are like bonus moves that you can do. And they can be used once a game. Here's one, the Age of Ultron. If Ultron's knocked out, he may spend eight power to play this card before removing the miniature. Ultron is not removed from the battlefield. Instead, he removes all special conditions, which can be like bleed or stagger, where you have to spend an action to remove it. Uh, flips his card to the healthy side, removes all wounds, drops all objective tokens, and may be placed within three of his current location. That's a super powerful card. And there's a good variety of these. There's one where a Hulk can throw someone up to range five away. There's reactive cards. If you get attacked, you can play these. And these are played face up, so your opponent is going to know what you do. And when you play the full game round, you're bringing eight of these to the to the battle. Each player is going to bring their set of ten minis, eight of these, and six crisis cards. And there's going to once you know what scenario you're playing, that's when you're going to spend your threat points. And out of those ten characters you bring, you're going to spend your points on it. Now there's going to be a number at the top of each crisis card. The player who isn't going first is going to determine the value. It could be 20 threat worth of a team. It could be 17. And that's pretty much the game. So there you have it. Marvel Crisis Protocol. Let's start with the cons. Now, first of all, this game is pretty expensive to get into. The, the base set is $110.00. You get 10 figures, a bunch of terrain, and your all your cards and shits and stuff. Now, from a miniatures games perspective, it's definitely reasonable. From a board game perspective, it's expensive. Also, all these figures do not come pre-assembled. They come in sprues, you have to assemble them, and some of these pieces are so small, it's crazy. I'm looking at you, Baron Zemo's elbow pads. Some of the pieces are so small, it's ridiculous, but it's not insurmountable. You do need to have the right tools, the right glue, and you have to be into the hobby end of things for games like this. You're also going to want to paint your figures, because uh, in a game like this, the paint really brings the game to life. I'm sure there's those of you out there that don't mind playing gray, but for me, painting them is a must. My biggest gripe with the game is that the rules for playing beyond the tutorial aren't even in the rule book. You have to download them from the website if you want to play the full setup, which I think is inexcusable. It's ridiculous. Sure, put the tutorial in. Why can't you add three pages of the full on play mode? 
the last gripe I have with the game is that the scenarios, even though there's you combine different crises, you got your red and your blue, they're all fairly similar. They all involve tokens, either picking a token up and holding on to it, or being close to a token. So I find a lot of the games, you're going to have some of your team that'll just run up and stand by tokens and try and collect victory points for that. Now, with multiple plays, the strategy becomes a little more involved and it, it will deviate from that somewhat. But at its core, it's run some guys up, stand near a token, go try and punch out guys standing near the tokens on their side of the battlefield. This is uh, definitely not a deal breaker. The game is still fun and Atomic Mass is releasing scenarios on their website which really changed things up. Not to mention when you buy new expandable character packs they're gonna have their own scenarios in there so I expect the variety in this to, uh, to change significantly. On their website they also have one versus many scenarios. Uh, they have an Ultron up right now where one player controls Ultron and the other players um, you have two other players with their own teams and Ultron's like super powerful so this is really cool. So let's move on with what I like about the game. First of all the rule set isn't complicated. It's a very streamlined rules and easy to pick up. I played this a ton with my 10 year old son and uh, it was a breeze to get into the rules, teach, and play subsequent games. It's not even a fraction as complicated as a game like Necromunda. Uh, another good thing about this is that the game is expandable. There's already a whole slate of new characters um, announced, and there's a lot of fun in getting new Marvel heroes and testing out their powers on the battlefield. Speaking of battlefield, the one thing this game does amazingly well is make you feel like you're having a super powered battle. The terrain is interactive. You're throwing terrain, you're throwing characters, you're jumping up on buildings. It's got that a very dynamic feel. Now you play a game 60-90 minutes and it's probably like 8 seconds in real time. I also really like the Team Tactics card. Uh, I think every miniatures game needs to have something off to the side that lets you um, break the rules or have special rules. That's why I like A Song of Ice and Fire because of the attachments and the um, deck of cards you have. Those extra tricks up your sleeve. So those team tactics cards are really fun. Like you play one that says a character within two of Hulk can move range five. So essentially you're jumping up Hulk is throwing you across the battlefield and I just love those kind of moves. It really spices it up. So I think if you're looking to get into a miniatures game, this is a great one to start in, especially if you like that Marvel theme. If putting together minis and painting them is not your thing, then you're probably happy with Marvel Champions the card game. For me, I went with this one instead. And I'm very much enjoying it. I'm very much going to keep collecting new heroes and villains that come out. And uh, if you're into the miniatures game, it's a recommend from me. So thanks for watching. I'm Jason Peacock, and I'll see you on the next one.